All right, so tonight we are meeting with Dick Solomon, who is the president of Pace Prince. And Pace is probably one of the, historically and probably still today, one of the world's best known art galleries situated in New York City and elsewhere. And so the gallery, Dick, started sometime before Pace Prince began. But my sense is, is that the, neither the ga well, the gallery wasn't successful until Pace Prince began, and that you were involved from the get-go. Um, uh, well, if you ask my, if you said that to my partner, I'd be dead in the morning. So you'd be reading my obituary. No, I, he was very successful from the get-go, and he, for example, he had the first pop art show outside of New York City, and and uh, he he had started in Boston. Uh, right out of art school, and uh, he was uh, successful from the moment on, and I wouldn't have joined him if I didn't think he was going to be really successful, and I could uh, sort of ride his back uh, to the limited success. Okay, so it cannot. Who was that, and what year are we talking about? Arnie Glimsher, it's about 1961, two, something like that in Boston. Okay, and he's still involved. Oh, yeah. He's, uh, he's involved, his son's involved, and yeah, he's very involved. And, um, all right, so what year did you come on board? Well, I bought the first thing he sold as an art dealer. I was a collector in those days. I was living in Boston. And uh, in 1968, uh, he wanted to do a project, uh, which he couldn't afford to do, and uh, a print project, uh, a book with uh, Lucas Samaras. And uh, as a result of that, I did... That is sort of a part-time venture working for another company. Uh, in, I was in the consumer uh, product, uh, consumer good business and advertising, and uh, I did that for a couple of years, and then it looked like we had a business, so uh, I gave up uh, that career and, and came into the gallery. All right, let's go back further. What was your entree into the art world? Did you ever, were you ever, did you ever think you were an artist, or how did, how did you begin? No, I, I can't throw a straight line. I, um, I, ba I basically at 16 uh, began collecting because my mother had an interest in art and uh, she dragged me around the galleries and I started collecting um, uh, sculptors' drawings and uh, uh, when I was 16 in those days that, that you know that for fifty dollars you could buy a Mayo or Lachaise or Archipanko uh, drawing and uh, you know that's how I started. Did you know who those men, those artists were when you began collecting, or you just find things you liked? Well, that's a good question, Paul. Because years later, when I moved to New York and I hung these drawings in the hall, I noticed that they were all uh, female nudes. So I'm not so sure that as a 16-year-old male, uh, I was attracted to the artist or to the uh, subject matter. Uh, but I would like to think that it was subject matter and that I knew what I was doing. Sounds good. Somebody just commented that you are difficult to hear. So in as much oh, as we sorry. don't. I'll, 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 uh, can, you, can you hear me better? Yeah, that's better, but maybe you want to be closer. I don't know. I mean, I'm not having a problem, but I've, I've got all kinds of infinite volume adjustments on my computer. I'll, I'll try to stare down the, uh, the computer here. Is that better for you all? Can you hear me better? Yeah, I, th I know it's better. Um, so what did you know about prints when you began? I mean, like when I started an art gallery, I didn't know the difference between a screen print and an etching and a lithograph. Um, I knew absolutely nothing. And, and uh, actually, um, in those days, you didn't have to learn. When, in the 70s, you didn't have to know much because most of the artists were um, artists who were uh, printing their work with best in screen printing and therefore, you could job it out to commercial screen printers, and you didn't have to know much. All you had to do is select an image uh, with the artist, and uh, if the, you know, and you said, "Okay, go do it." And so the screen printer did it. It wasn't until 1975 when uh, Jim Dine and Chuck Close and Agnes Martin, people like that, came into the gallery. Uh, Jim, especially, who knew something about. Uh, a print, so he knew a lot about print. He was a great printmaker, actually a, a, probably a, a great draftsman. And he came in, and then a fellow by the name of Joe Wilfer from Madison, Wisconsin. I know Joe. Did he die? Where's Joe? Joe, unfortunately, died of brain cancer in his 40s. Right. But, 
but he he um, he came to work with and he had invented for Chuck Close this method of making paper pulp prints. And Chuck uh, took him on, and then Chuck said to me, "Hey, you better take him on because this guy's really good." And this guy was really good. And then later on, a fellow by the name of Aldo Chromalink, uh, uh, Jim Dine put me together with Aldo Chromalink, who, as you know, was uh, Picasso, Miro, and Matisse's etcher. Uh, in the last uh, 20 years of Picasso's life, he was uh, Picasso's etcher, and so he knew a lot about prints. So. Uh, uh, you know, what I've learned technically is by osmosis and not by any intelligence. Um, you know, I'm more of a, you know, a part-time connoisseur and administrator and marketing kind of type that, that you know, uh, does that rather than uh, uh, gets involved in techni technical issues. Okay. Um, when Pace Prints began, were you printing solely Pace artists? That was the reason we started. We started basically to do that uh, because we felt that if if you represented the artist, you should let them uh, do whatever they wanted to do. And one of the things they wanted to do because of the pop artists and because of companies like Multiples and Gemini uh, uh, and uh, ULAE who had a head start on me, um, they were offering the artist the opportunity to come out and do that. And we thought that was a loss of control. So we decided that we wanted to control and uh, in one respect and also give the opportunity to the artists who were at pace to do what they would do with us. So that was the reason we did it. But uh, now uh, 150 artists later, um, I, uh, I would say that we probably at the moment uh, you know, are the least uh, involved with pace gallery artists. Unfortunately, uh, mainly because uh, so many of these guys that we started with have passed on or have left the gallery. Were there artists in the beginning who didn't want to make prints? Oh, sure. Uh, you know, um, yeah, and, and uh, you know, and some of them uh, we convinced to make prints and it was a big mistake. And, uh, you know, it's, it's an interesting thing and it's a, you, you can lead a horse to water, you can't make them drink. So uh, for periodically, we would ask an artist to do something, and they wouldn't feel really comfortable doing it, and it was a mistake to have asked them, but they were good guys and or you know, ladies, and, and they would do it. And uh, sometimes a mistake. But generally speaking, the Dubuffets and the Nevelsons and uh, Ernie Trovers and, uh, you know, Agnes Martin, people like that, um, were, you know, very happy uh, doing uh, prints, although uh, Agnes and I, uh, we had a wonderful project with Agnes. Uh, Aldo Chromalink did a print, and I went out to have her uh, sign it. And uh, after protesting that she really didn't want to sign it, she finally said, yes, I'll sign it. And by the time I got back to New York, she had called Arnie and said, Arnie, you know, I don't like this print. So we took the saw and we cut it in half and sent it back to her. Uh, but that was rare, luckily. It'd be nice to have half of that of those half of that of the, the top half of the edition. No, you want only the signed half. <laughs> yeah, the side half. Um, I, I have, I'm curious. I mean, you know, we have a group here of 35, 40 visual artists in, that are you know listening to this conversation, and there'll be more that hear the recording. I'd like to you know do some things perhaps that they can extrapolate from. Um, would you argue unequivocally that adding printmaking to one's over is a good strategy to get you more exposure and have more work available, or is it only sometimes a good idea? Um, I, I think you know. Firstly, it's 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 a craft that is involved, so you have to have some concept and uh, or interest in the craft. Uh, it is time consuming. It is not what I would consider. Uh, I consider it, frankly, lunch money. Um, it's not something that you should really think of as a way of, uh, of, uh, of increasing your your net uh, your net profit, so to speak, or your income in a great way. But but it is an opportunity to collaborate, and many artists today are already collaborating with uh, with people in their studio. So it's not like it used to be a, a, a you know where artists really were uh, very uh, solitary, but 
this is a, an opportunity to collaborate, uh, an opportunity to work with some very, very talented people in our place in Gemini and ULA. There are, not, there are lots of places, Tandem. Uh, there are lots of really interesting uh, print studios. But the most important thing, and you hit it, and the most important thing, it gets your image out. I mean, it gets your image out. And the way we try to sell it is we really think of ourselves as educators. We think that we're educating a public visually and uh, bringing them into the, the world of art collecting. And in today, where the unique work is so expensive, and uh, and sometimes so pretentious and, and difficult to get to, that prints are a, an interesting uh, way of doing that. That being said, it's difficult for a print, print publisher to publish artists who are unknown uh, to a, a decent amount of the public. And uh, that is a problem, but um, uh, it, you know, again, it's it's imagery. It's uh, you know uh, sometimes a, an image uh, by an artist who nobody knows uh, takes off, and you know the artist uh, in, ends up having a relationship with some gallery. But uh, it's difficult if you do not have some kind of gallery representation to use prints as a stepping stone to. Um, greater exposure. Okay, let's. So we're all on the same page. Define an original print for me. Well, that's a conundrum. Um, that's. You, know, I, I mean, you want me to do it? <laughs> <laughs> no, I look. You know, every. I remember going out to Chicago, and and uh, there was a. a, a a, a gra the Graphics Arts Council or the Print Council, whatever, I think it was the Print Council, and, and they were having a discussion. Are screen printings, you know, are they unique? Are they original? I mean, they were, you know, and I, I wasn't on the panel, but I went to the audience because that's all I was doing is screen printing, and I didn't want these guys to get away with murder by saying that they're not original. But in my opinion, uh, Today, we have so many different processes for making prints. And a lot of that is purely reproductive. If the artist enjoys and thinks that reproducing a painting or reproducing something by some technical means that gives you an image that is respectable, then my sense is, you know, that's great. You know, that's, that's the artist. The artist has that opportunity to do that. But, um, you know, so I don't think that, I, I'm not sure it's, it's helpful to try to define what an original print is. Um, is a poster an original print? Oh, I guess it's an original print. Um, you know, is a digital reproduction of a painting an original print? Yeah, if the artist says it is, it is. Now, I don't, frankly, enjoy that. I mean, I, I like the artist to make an image, especially for a print project. And I think that has more integrity than a reproduction of an existing work of art. But I'm not going to argue with an artist that says, hey, listen, uh, why, don't you, why don't you make a print out of this? And if you do it technically so it looks great and it, it you know, you take, you reduce the scale or you change it in some way. Um, Chuck Close is a great example. I don't think that, uh, that I don't, rem I don't think there's any Chuck Close that we've done that has come, that he has made a, yes, there were a few early on, some of the, uh, uh, some of the things, that, uh, the scribble etchings, and a couple of things that he did when he did it with his own hands. But, but you know, he's, he's, he hasn't been able to do it. And, and so, some really talented people have interpreted paintings that he has made uh, into prints. Uh, right now, they're doing what they call watercolor prints, which are uh, taking his mark and using a computer 
and it is a reproductive process that has created a very interesting image that's very different than the unique work that it's coming from. So, long winded. I'm, I'm older school than you on this one, I think. I yeah. remember, I remember, oh my goodness, 30 years ago, and you probably remember Walter Maybaum. And Walter Maybaum, who, uh, he went to Salvador Dali and said, I want to commission you to do a print. And Dali said, fabulous, and handed him a watercolor and 200 signed pieces of paper and said, go ahead. Now, well, that was bullshit. I mean, the problem with that was that, you know, he didn't, he didn't give a damn whether, uh, what happened. He just, uh, just re re reproduce it. Look, I got in terrible trouble because, you know, after Agnes Martin rejected this beautiful etching that uh, uh, that uh, Chromalink had done, uh, she said, you know, my idea of a print is take one of my drawings and make a print. Right. And she went to the Whitney and she did it. And I didn't really want to do that. So she went to the Whitney and the Whitney sold them. And I said, well, Agnes, if you're going to do it for the Whitney, What's wrong with Solomon? He's he's a good guy. Do it for Solomon, you know. Whitney Solomon, same breath. Anyway, so sure. uh, so we did it, and of course the guys at Tamarin went bananas. That's not a lithograph. Well, of course we call it a lithograph because we were going to call it an offset lithograph because offset immediately meant sort of reproduction, right? So exactly, uh, exactly. So well, it was a reproduction, perfect reproduction, done in scale and everything else, and she signed it. She was very happy with it. She considered it an original print. She didn't think that Chromalink had done a good job. So basically, so basically, for you, it comes down to the artist's intent and the artist's degree of satisfaction. Yeah, I think I think that's the bottom line for me. And you know, some of some purists like yourself uh, would say, "Hey, come on, come on, guys," you know. But you know. Uh, you're you're not a dealer in prints, you know. You're you're you know. So anyway, I I think that I think it's worth the discussion, and I think there's a um, there's some latitude there here. I think there's some areas where, for example, I do not like the idea of using digital methods of making reproductions. Now, is that any different than an offset lithograph? No. And I'll tell you something, frankly, you know, you know, I don't want to do offset lithographs. I don't want to do, uh, uh, I don't want to do digital reproductions. At the same time, you know, uh, when you take a, uh, uh, when you do an, an etching plate using photographic methods, you know, a, as transfer or transfer paper as Picasso made his etch, uh, lithos, you know, that's a gray area. What about G clays? That that That's you what just I'm talking about. I'm talking about digital. I mean, uh, that, yeah. I, I, I'm saying when you if if you use a digital printer to you know copy, it's the same as offset, as far as I'm concerned. And I'm not crazy about offset, as you can tell. So, do you think an artist? I mean, lots of artists today are wrestling with should I make G clays or should I not? Well, I and, think. Well, I think if you use a well, if you use a computer uh, productively and creatively, absolutely fine. I mean, you know, that's, I mean, that technology should be the the servant of the creative person. So, from from my standpoint, absolutely no problem. But uh, I mean, it's not it's not that much different than a photographer who's taking an in, a digital image and prints it out digitally and makes it a limited edition of five or six pieces. And I mean, that's essentially same thing. A, same thing. Same thing. Yeah. But, he, but the artist, but, but the artist has created the image. So he's using, so instead of doing a C print, he's using, you know, I don't see a problem. Uh, to me, it's perfectly a natural thing to do. All right. But let's deal with the G clays specifically. Do you feel like, it it tarnishes the artist. Do you feel like it tarnishes the artist? No way. Well, again, it's it's how it's used. Okay. You know, it's how it's used. If it's used as a totally reproductive method of taking something and photographing it, you know, 
that's different than a photograph. You know, that's different than a photograph. Uh, Do you so feel like, what, 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 I'm shifting gears. Do you, I feel like the 70s was the he, the heyday of prints. Am I right or wrong? Yeah, because of the artists. I mean, the artists were in, into it. Uh, the the images were easily uh, translated into prints. Uh, there was some kind of focus. You know, uh, you had the pop art movement was a fabulous moment for printmaking. And uh, I don't think that uh, any anything since then uh, has equaled it. I mean, you know, and and today, uh, you know, uh, you name the guys, the pop artists, they still are controlling the print market. They're still, you know, you have to add Deben Corn, you have to add Hockney, you know, a few other people. But again, they these guys were all producing stuff in the 70s. Are all paste prints, are all paste prints today created in paste print facilities? Uh, I would say, um, yeah, I would say 99%. I'm trying to think of anything that's not done in our facilities. Yes, yeah, so I have one guy who's do, working with Chuck Close, who's done a number of woodcut projects with him. But uh, other than that, I can't think of, yeah, 90%, 99.9% .9 of them are done in-house. And we have uh, paper making, we have uh, screen printing, we have etching. Uh, uh, we have all kinds of relief pr prints. So uh, we have Yukioe woodcut prints. So we have a, a full range. The only thing I don't do is lithography, and I've stayed away from that. So none of you artists are making lithos? That is correct. Okay. Um, I'm going to here. I'm going to post a list. Of, you can take a look at the artists here. I just posted um, a link to that. Um, So sometimes you've printed, you've done prints with artists who were not represented by Pace. What happens with an artist who is represented by Pace, and they leave, they they move, they move to a, some other gallery, and does the print relationship perhaps continue, or does that terminate it? For the most part, it's terminated. Uh, you know, uh, I mean, we we have some artists like. Uh, uh, it's Chamberlain, for example, we're still handling his prints. He left uh, the gallery a while ago. Um, I'm trying to think of uh, some of the artists, but um, most of the artists who have left the gallery were not print. Were not people we are publishing. Ah, that explains it. Um, <laughs> okay, now how? If an artist isn't somebody that is represented by Pace, how do, how did what's the decision making process about making prints for them? Is the addition paid for by somebody else, or maybe you should explain how maybe we should explain how printing works and publishing works and what the difference is, and you know take a moment to do that. Okay. Well, uh, when you publish, what you're basically doing is you are. Um, well, let me step back. We're we're the only gal we're the only business, integrated business, that does publishing both wholesale and 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 also has retail galleries. Gemini has sort of a quasi uh, situation uh, with the Joni Wow, but but we're the only person that basically has a a gallery that uh, is totally uh, owned by the same people uh, who are publishing. So we do two things. We we distribute to our own galleries. We have two, one on 57th Street and one in Chelsea. And we distribute to dealers around the world. Uh, and we go to art fairs to sell both at retail or to collectors and to other dealers. So we structure our publishing arrangements as based on the fact that we're publishers, not as we're retailers. So that uh, we're basically structuring a deal where uh, all of the revenue is considered to be publishing revenue, not retail revenue. And, and so we, we 
sell to our self, to our galleries, at the same price as we sell to other dealers. So we have two profit centers. One is publisher and one is retailer. And what we do with these artists is we go and we talk to them. And sometimes we talk to their dealers. Sometimes we don't. Sometimes we co-publish with their dealers. It really depends. Uh, some some people don't have dealers. It really, it, it, you know, uh, years ago, a research company called me, and they were trying to do research for somebody who was thinking of going into the art business, the publishing business. And after about five minutes of listening to these questions, I said, will you do me a favor? Have your, your client call me directly, because I can't give you yes and no answers. In our business, in the art world, nothing, there are no two situations that are alike. Yes, our publishing arrangements generally speaking, are the same because I'm not smart enough to remember a deal for each different artist. So most of our are the same, with a couple of exceptions. So, uh, but, but basically, all right, so the publisher goes to an artist and says, you know, I really like your work. Uh, would you like to, uh, would you be willing to publish with us? And they will say, well, what's, you know, what, what do you want? And we say, well, this is what I like. And why don't you come in? And uh, uh, one of the people who, look, uh, who works for me likes to use the word residencies. Well, I think that's a little pretentious. But in any event, we ask them to come in and uh, work with the printer. We had a young woman come in this week from China. And she worked with the printers for a few days and uh, got a feeling of what the printers could do and what she could do. And we ended up with a project. It will be very good, but based on, you know, talking and working it out with the printers. So that's not basically, so a publisher basically gets a hold of an artist and tries to come up with a creative project using one of the processes or some of, sometimes many of the processes that we work. For example, our Shepard Ferry uh, uh, did a very good project with us that would involve paper making and screen printing. And that happens a lot. Um, so uh, basically that's the way we do it. There, there are publishers who don't ha own or have a financial interest in any, a print shop though too, right? Where they will contract with a printer to create an edition with the artist that they will buy and then resell. Less, less than it used to be. Uh, yeah, less than it used to be. Today, really there are, um, there are some, some local, uh, obviously some local people who are publishing. Um, there, there are two groups now, really. There are about four or five major independent publishers, and there are three or four a very fine uh, university-sponsored uh, pub, uh, publishers. So uh, there are about, I would say, 10 or 12 uh, publishing uh, operations in this country. Uh, there's now, a, there are a few in Europe. There's one now, and uh, Ken Tyler sold his business to the Singapore government, and they have a Tyler Graphics in Singapore. Um, China at the moment does not really do much. They do mostly reproductions that are made in Korea. Uh, India uh, doesn't do much either in prints. Uh, you know, so uh, the problem in China is quality control. The problem in India is quality control. Europe is good. Uh, you know, Europe has been, been good for years. England has some good publishers. So there, are, you know, worldwide, maybe 25 publishers. Is there a linear relationship between the cost of an original work of art, let's say a, a Chuck Close painting, and the cost, the, the retail of a print? I shot close again. Is there is there a, a, a somewhat static relationship between a print and a painting? It's a, it's a little bit more confusing for uh, it, it, for people like Chuck Close. It's not so difficult because you 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 set a price. You, you know what it costs you, and and the, these prints that Chuck does are very very costly. Um, the last one we did uh, with Joe Watanabe took two years to do. Um, you know, so um, uh, so we come up with a price. Uh, pay no attention at all to what the latest Chuck Close painting is sold for. We just come up with a price which we think, uh, based on the last one that we published, what 
where it is now and, and how far it's gone up. And we try to come up with a price that is uh, an incentive to purchase early and has a way to appreciate, to make everybody feel good, the artist and the collector. Okay, so how do you structure the price? What's, um, take <clears throat> a Chuck Close print that was so, you know, from a few years ago, and it's much retail today. Pick an, it's an arbitrary number, but, you know, I just want to go through the comparison. Um, you know, Chuck is selling his prints, his paintings now for several million dollars. Uh, I think the most expensive, well, there's one, there's, there was one print that is, uh, I think, about $750,000. It, it's a, uh, almost a unique uh, print that was done in the 70s. But, um, you know, right now, I would say, you know, a uh, hundred dollars, uh, a hundred thousand dollars is is the high price for a Chuck Close print. Um, it, right now, um, the newest prints that are coming out, that uh, editions of five, uh, these watercolor uh, prints are seventy thousand. Uh, the unique ones are a hundred thousand. Uh, we are uh, currently uh, asking uh, forty five thousand for a screen print that we did in two o two. Uh, you know, so I don't think the, the relationship between, uh, you know, uh, between his painting and his prints, the, the interesting thing about Chuck, which is really fascinating, is he's one of the few artists who gets killed at auction. Um, you know, I don't know why that is. Uh, there's a very good market for him. Yeah, you're right. But, you know. But then I, want, I, want, I, want, I want to look at what a reasonable previous Chuck Close edition was selling for and then how all right so then what number would a new Chuck Close edition with a comparable degree of difficulty and comparable edition size what kind of what percentage of the previous would that be 80 90 and then escalate from there well let's take this current let's t let's take this current screen print that we did uh the, these watercolors that just came out for $70,000, and he's doing a lot of them, and I don't know how much appreciation and how fast that's going to happen. But let's take a look at the screen print uh, 2012 that we did. Uh, let's assume that uh, I think it's now 40, 45,000. Uh, I think before we, ha uh, I'm not sure we'll have another one, but we're going to have a woodcut that's going to come out. It's going to be um, very much smaller than that. Uh, we'll probably get the screen print up to about 60,000 and then release this new screen print, uh, another screen print, this new woodcut at probably around 40,000 or 35,000, something like that. How do you determine edition size? Uh, I, I, I sit down with this uh, and I have a seance with myself. And, uh, you know, and the number just floats into my head. Uh, I have no idea. I mean, what we try to do is look at past precedent. So if the last time we did this and it was an edition of 35, we'll probably do an edition of 35 again. Uh, sometimes it has to do with the, with the, um, the amount of in, uh, how, how, how tired the printer is of doing the same thing over and over again. Um, all right, so let's take an edition of 35. How many do you sell before you raise the price? Well, first of all, you, you, you pre-publish? No, no. And, and, you know, there's no formula. You know, it's, it's one of those things. It depends. You know, in, in 207, uh, I thought there was, you know, I thought the sky was up. Uh, I expanded the business. I, 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 we were running so good, uh, and we're doing so well that I just I opened uh, two spaces in Chelsea. I opened a print for, I mean, I, I just went crazy in building overhead. And since 2007 or 2008, you know, I've been regretting those moves from a bottom line standpoint. I didn't regret them at all from an operational standpoint or from what I thought was right and right for the artist and everything else. But uh, if I knew then what I know now, would I have done it? Absolutely not. So, you know, it's a lot has to do with what the weather's like. 
You know, uh, what's the climate? What's the, uh, you know, what, what is the artist still in favor? Is, is the market, how's the market treating the, the receptor? The, how, what's the artist's unique work like? You know, it, uh, uh, you know, one of the interesting things is Jim Dine just is doing a, it just has a show right now in which they're abstract, there's no image. Okay. How's that going to, how's that going to affect his print market? You know, I don't know. Um, now for me, when I look at those paintings, I see the bathrobe and the heart because he's doing the same marks that he would do if he was do, doing a, you know, he's just left off the image. But I don't know whether anybody besides myself is looking at them and saying, what's the difference? Does Pace Gallery have contracts with most of They must have contracts, no, 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 I don't think so, no. It's fascinating, because, you know, so many lawyers tell galleries and artists to have contracts, but the norm is a hearty handshake. What about, what about with the, the print establishment, with Pace Prints and the artists? Do you have contracts? Um, sometimes I have letters that I, I write to the artists and explain to them what the deal is going to be. It, that would be that would be the normal thing with the Chinese guys. I wrote a contract, but you know uh, that's about worth you know that isn't worth the paper it's written on. Um, so you know so uh, no I, I we don't have contracts. Like, you know this is a business of um, of mutual trust and mutual. Um, uh, you know, if, if it's almost like family. If you if you don't get along, then you don't get along, and if you can't you you can't run a relationship. So a piece of paper means nothing. If you're not getting along, and if you don't both think that you're doing the best you can for each other, then you might as well part company, shake hands, and say, "Hey, good luck." Yeah, that's that's pretty much how I feel. Um, why don't we open this up for questions in a second? You guys, you know, raise your hands if you've got questions. Let me ask one more thing. How do artists get paid? Are there are there a variety of scenarios? Do they get a a certain fee for creating an edition, and or do they get a percentage of sales? Do they get yeah. paid in prints? What? Yeah, no, they well, firstly, they get artist proofs, and but that's no big deal. Uh, I think the major they basically what I've always done is made the artist my partner. And I felt that that was a way of ensuring that they would, um, you know, that they would have their best interests at heart. And you know, early on, uh, it was like it, it, it's an interesting thing. You know, every once in a while, a charity comes to an artist and says, "Would you do a print for me?" And every once in a while, the artist doesn't want to do it and so they give them they sort of rip themselves off with a lousy piece of art and I tell everybody you know you're you you're praised uh, you're condemned by the worst not praised by the best so if you're going to do something if you're going to say yes give them something really good if you're going to then say no if you don't want to do it but don't put don't put something lousy out in the market because you know, somebody's going to see that and They'll remember that. So my sense basically is one of the ways I felt of sort of ensuring myself or ourselves that that might happen is by having them participate totally in two ways. Firstly, participate in, in giving us the image, but also participate in the upside. So that if, if there's an upside, they ride with it. And so I've always felt that that was the best deal for the artist, and that uh, that you know that uh, now sometimes that comes and hurts you. I mean, for example, one with David Hockney, I had a, David Hockney had a contract. I had a contract for three years with a group of prints, and I just didn't feel that David Hockney would ever call me on the contract. So I managed to just you know get a little out at a time, a little at a time, and I think we took something like. We went from like 3,500 to almost 25,000 uh, for some of these prints. And at the end of three years, when I had still a lot of inventory and was hoping that I would really had really gotten really smart and this we were starting to sell stuff at 20, 25, 22, you know, he said we'll send it all back. So that's the only time that uh, I really gotten burnt by uh, 
uh, holding back and trying to manage escalation. Uh, and again, but I want to make one thing very, very uh, clear. I have never ever, or we have never ever tried to sell Prince as an investment. Uh, our feeling basically, we've said it a million times, that if you get X number of years of enjoyment out of a print, consider yourself well paid for. And, and you know, and, and uh, that, that if you're buying prints for investment, it's not really a great investment because the cost of getting in and getting out is high. And, uh, you know, if you want to invest, Firstly, you better know what you're doing, and secondly, you're better off in unique work. I'm glad to hear that. Do you guys have any questions? I don't. I don't see any hands. I was asked today to give a talk about investing in contemporary art, and I said I'd be glad to take the other side and debate it, um, and or maybe you should make it a panel. But you know, I don't know. An awful lot of people are, in, you know, I mean, in investing. In art, and it's well, you've got a funny situation going on, Paul. You, pe people are collecting now with their ears, not their eyes. You've got a totally. You've got the, the dynamics of the art world is totally changed from what I went in the art world, and I don't understand it. Number one, the auction houses, Sotheby's, fifty percent of Sotheby's business was private sales. Fifty percent. They're an auction house. What the hell are they doing in the private sale business? But that's where they are. Um, art fairs. You know, if you want to go to an art fair and you can leave the art fair without having uh, retina, retinal indigestion, <laughs> you've, got to, you've got to be fantastic. I mean, ret I mean, uh, I just went to the art, uh, Pier 94 uh, at the you know at the pier here in New York, and I came out of that you know wanting to change my profession. Um, it was really horrible. So. But now we're running. We have this big investment in New York, a big investment. And we're running to Hong Kong. We're running to the pier. We're running to Chicago. We're running all over the place to do business in the art fairs. And people aren't coming in galleries. They're going to, they're event oriented. They want to go to auctions. They want to go to art fairs. And it's interesting because collections were, collectors were built, collections were built by dealers educating clients. And you could frequently go into a home and know who the dealer was that educated that client. True. Today, today there's, there are art consultants flooding the market, talking to each other, telling them what's hot, what's not. And the collector, you know, doesn't bother to come in and get educated or learn or, you know, so that it's a flavor of the month. It's a crazy scene. And so investment, you know, that's part of it. I think part of it uh, over the last few years where the stock market wasn't, didn't look like if people had a lot of money, what are they going to do with it? Well, we might as well spend it because we can't invest it not making money. So, you know, it's a, it's a world that um, I don't, uh, you know, I, I, I tandem, I, I was just listening to the recording of our of tandem, and, and I was listening to myself say, I'm a 20th century guy. I'm a 20th century guy, and I'm not so sure the 21st century, I've caught on to that yet. Uh, and I'm not sure I like it if it, you know, or I want to catch on, but I guess if I'm going to continue to survive and run a business, I better learn it. But well, it's really interesting because there, there, there's some attrition in the art world where, you know, certain public figures are, you know, just leaving it and saying this is too much BS and it lacks the integrity. But, you know, I don't know. It always had a different kind of integrity. But then there's also, the you know, the issue, the question of, you know, artists and how a good, you know, art, art exhibit in a gallery by a significant artist is pushing and challenging other artists, and to a larger extent, those artists are not going to gallery exhibits with the same fervor or numbers that they used to, which I think moves the dialogue, the discussion between artists along in a different kind of a manner. You know, when de Kooning would have a show, it would be one thing. Today, you know, you've really got to be something to get the show to have a lot of critical attention. I think attention. one of the real problems right now is uh, is bigger better? Um, you know, if you go to Larry Gagosian's uh, shows recently, where he has this fabulous space—I mean, it's it's bigger than most museums, 
And firstly, he had the first Rauschenberg, uh, we lost Rauschenberg uh, to, to Larry. And so the first estate show he has is, I mean, it was, it was the worst show I ever saw. I mean, Rauschenberg was such a great artist and the show that they put on was really the worst. Uh, right now, there's a Frankenthaler show. Well, I think Frankenthaler's a really good artist. Her her, her later work, uh, middle career work was great. Her later work was good. Her early work was like student work. She was working out with, with you know, Greenberg. Uh, and if you look at it, it looks like the history of abstract expressionists before she started to paint. And the, all these paintings there are about 30 or 40 or 50 paintings there. And, and there are one or two of them. One from the Museum of Modern Arts, very good. But it's an academic thing. Well, I don't think that's doing the artist any good. All right, that's one thing. So bigger and better. So if these guys are competing now. What pace is in the game, too, with competition in space? So you've got these big guys trying to compete with space. Okay, then the other thing that's happening is, in my opinion, is, you know, there's no basic uh, schools right now. Uh, you know, there's there's... Um, sort of creative chaos. Nobody in the in prior times you had you could focus in on uh, schools, right? Right now there was abstract expressionism. There was this. There was that. Right now it's like it's like a free for all. So I think it's a very very tough climate for the artist and for the dealer and for the collector. And so I think that's one of the reasons why our consultants are doing so well right now because the collectors are really confused. They want to be in the game, but they don't know, and they don't want to spend the time. And maybe they don't know how to go about it. And maybe that's not, so, maybe they're right. Maybe, you know, I'm not sure I know how to go about it right now. Although I must tell you that, uh, uh, you know, I think that the, uh, uh, it's going to be interesting in the next five or 10 years to see uh, how uh, these influences of the uh, computer uh, animation and things like that are gonna, already influencing it, and I think they're going to influence more and more of uh, the creativity that's going to take place. For me, the single biggest criterion of buying a work of art is that it stimulates me, and I think it's going to for a while. And that hasn't, you know, I don't see that for me that changes. You know, and I think if you're investing in art or you're listening too much to an art consultant, you're buying with somebody else's taste in mind instead of yours. And, and that sort of, I think, bastardizes the whole experience. Well, my, my sense, basically, if, if, I, if I really look at a work of art and I get it immediately, something's wrong. Yeah, then you don't need it. Yeah, exactly. Something's wrong. So... So oftentimes I have stupidly rejected something that I really didn't spend enough time to look at. However, sometimes I buy something and I'm not really sure that I understand it. The best for me was an Agnes Martin I bought in 1960-something, which I don't think I really understood until the 70s. You know, what is this stuff with this line business? What's going on here? And then all of a sudden, I, oh, my God, it's so beautiful. Yeah, so if, if a work of art it, it stops challenging, firstly, if you, if, it cha if, if you immediately go for it, I tell everybody, and, you know, sometimes my sales force wants to kill me, but I say, why don't you take it home and see what it looks like? Take it home. Yeah. You know, it was a couple of days. See it, take it home. You know, you know, enjoy it for a couple of days, or, or maybe you won't enjoy it. But I'd much rather you... See, you know, out of the gallery environment in your own home and forced to look at it, to make a decision. I once bought a work on paper by Ed Moses because I hated it. And I couldn't understand why it bothered me so damn much. And I had to live with it to get in touch with that. You know, and then maybe 20 years later, I ended up representing Ed, you know, and he kind of loved that story. Um, yeah. John How many times has that happened? A lot. Probably so. John, you have a question. Go ahead. A uh, real simple question. Um, I kind of hate to interrupt this because it's such a meaningful conversation, but it, I heard you mention that um, uh, you don't do lithography anymore. Did I hear that correctly? I'm a big fan of lithography. Is there something going on in the world of lithography? 
But John, I, I, I tell you, um, I'm not a fan of lithography. Um, I'm a big fan of etching. Um, and you know, you, you just can have so many processes. Uh, and most of the artists, uh, you know, uh, there have been a couple of uh, times that saw, uh, um, Klaus Olderberg uh, used to like lithography and it, it did it and uh, with a fellow by the name of Maurice Sanchez. Um, and so when, you know, but recently, you know, most, most of the artists we've worked with have, uh, you know, Jim Dine loves lithography. He has stones and does the whole thing. So, um, you know, it's, it's a, you can't do everything. And I, I, you know, I got so many things going on now and I have, you know, most of my space is, is, is locked in. So, and, and I didn't feel like I could, uh, afford to get, uh, go into stones and the whole thing that I'd like to go into. And so, it, it, so my prejudice is etching versus lithography and therefore, you know, but, uh, I also think that lithography is flatter, uh, than I, I, I there's something about etching that, uh, you know, that, that plate mark, I guess it, it has some romance for me. Well, yeah, but then how do you, how do you embrace screen prints? Screen prints totally different thing. I mean, you you know that uh, you know I think you get a flat color and a an intensity of color that you don't get in lithography either. So you know, so my sense is it's apples and oranges. I think you know etching okay. you get one look, uh, screen printing you get another, and uh, you know. And the other thing is, you know, it's where you came from. I came from when when Jack Youngerman and those guys were, you know, doing uh, flat screen prints and Trover and those guys. And so, you know, uh, that was, uh, you know, sort of my birthright. So. Krasnick and Spalatin. Um, John, I'm with you on lithographs. I used to own half of a lithography shop and... I, I know a lot, you know, I mean, some of it is like that Dick is saying, some of it's what you know. I understand lithography better than I understand etchings. I like etchings and screen prints sort of leave, pardon the pun, sort of leave me flat. I just wondered if it had anything to do with the decline of uh, stone lithography and the, the difficulties of stone lithography and the advance of mechanical lithography and Absolutely, the, uh, John. Commercial you nailed art, the commercial you, art. Yeah, you nailed it, John. That, that I think that I think the whole idea of the stones uh, that you know that, that uh, you know that uh, the uh, the Europeans sort of had the corner uh, sort of cornered the market on uh, on good lithographic stones and. And, uh, you know, there have been a few, uh, ULAE has a terrific lithographic uh, operation. And uh, there's some, uh, uh, I, I don't think Tandem does, maybe they do, but uh, it's just one of the things that, you know, no, nothing against it. I just didn't get into it. And uh, I've rationalized uh, the reason why. <laughs> well, just, uh, I'm sorry to hear you feel that way. <laughs> you know, I like them. Yeah. All right, um, but that was a good question. Barry, your turn. Go ahead, Barry. I'm sorry to hear about the lithographs, too, because I'm a lithographer. <laughs> but um, I was just interested more about the, the paper printmaking when Joe came in. I know Ruth Lingen prints a lot of your paperwork now. Um, were you the only shop that does unique paper prints? Because I don't, I don't know a lot about the publishing world that way, but I've not seen a lot of other artists and Publishers use that technique. Well, you know, Joe Wilfer, who uh, came out of Madison, uh, was a real was a paper maker, a paper maker fanatic. He trained Ruth, and uh, you know, and she's uh, uh, almost as creative as Joe. Um, it, it, there are other places doing paper, making paper. I don't know exactly uh, who they are, what they are, but you know, I think she's as good as they come, and. Uh, you know, between Chuck Close and uh, all the other stuff she's done, uh, she's in. Uh, we just did some uh, uh, fantastic stuff. Uh, but um, you know, she's she's as good as they come. And and uh, you know, and and the good thing about it is that what she's done is so imaginative. You know, it's uh, uh, it's it's really quite uh, uh, quite fantastic. 
but I, I don't know of anything. I can't. I can't think of a a, a mill that is that uh, important at the moment. So when an artist comes in, um, and let's say Ruth is the collaborator, uh, and the person who's the artist doesn't have any idea of how to approach a any kind of printmaking at all, and would she then tutor her or, or him along some lines, or do you find other printers that might have, you know, collaborating between Ruth, a, a silk screener, and somebody else uh, to create the print? Well, generally speaking, what happens is that, uh, you know, uh, I think that Ruth, you have to know what the work, what the artist's work is like. Um, I think it's important to know what the unique work is like and see and try to put yourself in the position of saying how can I how can I re react to the artist um, what he does what he or she does in a unique work in my paper and so what you frequently do is before the artist even shows up do some tests to show, hey, look, these are some ideas. You, you know, get the artist thinking about uh, what she's done. And that's one way. Sometimes an artist comes in and uh, says, hey, let me play around. And then you really get nervous. What does that mean? Uh, anyway, uh, She's a such a creative person that uh, it is amazing to see what happens. And you know, but it's 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 a collaboration. It's a, it's an interesting dance. It's definitely a collaboration, and that's an important thing I think to emphasize. And sometimes I feel like with some prints, some artists, I see too much of the printer's hand or too much of the the printer's. Well, that was the trouble with Ken Tyler. I mean, with Ken Tyler. That's true. You could oh, you could tell if it was printed on what that foam core stuff. Ken was terrific, but you would that you knew it was a Tyler print. Now that's not true at Gemini, and that's not true at ULAE. You know, no, you're right. But with Tyler, it was true. But you could you could look at a Frank Stella that was printed with Ken, and you'd go, "Yep, I know where that came from." But also, don't you think that there are times where the printmaking process um has influenced the artist's painting sculpture direction and i mean i feel like chuck close's paint his paintings have been informed by his printmaking i mean it's not always like printmaking is the bastard child i can't i can't give you chapter and verse but i can't tell you how many times um an artist has said to us you know, this was a great experience because, look, I mean, I, I just learned so much about, look, I mean, making different plates, um, working in reverse. Uh, there's so many things that go on in making a print that is different than making a painting. And also, it gets you the hell out of the studio so you have a breath of fresh air and you get it, you know, you get outside and you come back and you, you know, it, it, and printmaking also is discipline. You know, it's, you know, some artists can go in the studio and they redo and this and that and, they, you know, and they can play around with paint the way you can't play around in the print process. It's very disciplined. So sometimes the discipline of printmaking ends up being a tremendous thing for the artist. True. Um we should move towards wrapping this up, I think. Um, are there are do artists submit things to paste prints? Do they do you get portfolios or emails or packets of images and, and, and does it ever do the art has the artist ever been has it ever benefited the artist? No. <laughs> okay. No, um I mean, you know, I mean, why? Because, you know, um it, it, I mean I hate to I hate to be that negative, but you know, you know it, what usually happens. The best way to get seen or heard is for another artist, an artist that you're working with, to say, "You go, you should go take a look at this guy's work." You know, 
this guy it's very interesting work um it's you know uh now what is is fine is for, with me is that if if an artist calls me or writes me and says i'm having a show would you would you go see it okay and that is that is smart for an artist to do that's a smart thing that's a smart thing for an artist to do to find a gallery or a better gallery you know um to, to to send a note and say, you know, it would really be great if you could do this. Or if you have a friend of yours who has, you know, calls up the, uh, an artist and the artist says, you know, a friend of mine is having a show. Go see it. See what you think. That's, that's a good thing. Uh, the worst thing in the world for me is going to an artist studio um, that I've never seen the work before or sometimes I have. And it's it's so difficult because how do you go to an artist's studio and say anything negative and feel good about it? So you can't about it. Huh? You can't. It's really difficult. It, it's impossible. And so you know because you know I mean an artist. But uh, every day I wake up and I say, thank God I'm not an artist because uh, you know a playwright. Hey, you can't like you know. It, it, you write a play and nobody goes up and belts you over the head or goes to you and say, you know, lousy play to your face. So an artist, you know, and the, and the artist has nowhere to hide. You know, it, it's right there. Uh, you know, you can blame it's the publisher. You can... but, but, but you're saying, but one of the ways that you artists become, you become aware of artists is because they're recommended to you by others. Other artists, a, a dealer, a curator that says, Dick, this is interesting. It might be up your alley. Yes. And and what I say to them, you know, it, it, you know, where's the artist show? And let me know. And periodically, I do go to studios. I mean, I do I, I do go to studios, but usually, I go to studios where I think the chances are that um, I'm going to be okay. Um, yeah, sure. You know that I'm not going to be in a situation where I say, "Gee, you're a nice." I mean. You know, yeah. I always am able to find one really or two or three or four redeeming social qualities that I can, you know, but the artist knows and I know that, um, I'm, you know, it's camouflage. I think, you know, I, I want to reiterate and wrap it up with this, you know, that, so, that relationships in the world and in particular the art world are really important. And this is the kind of thing, you know, we've heard repeatedly from other guest experts um and i don't know i mean sometimes i think people think it's a secret but to have someone of significant to have someone that you know recommend you know your 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 art to them uh or their art to you is you know the best way to go well yeah third person you know and and i'll tell you one of the reasons why the auctions are so successful is that when you go to an auction and there are people in the room bidding on something you might like. That gives you a sense of security uh, because there's somebody else that likes your work. And so, you know, when I used to go to art, African art auctions and I didn't know really the good from the bad, I used to see who was bidding. And if a dealer who I had a respect for was bidding, then I knew it must be good. And so, uh, so the idea of a third person. Um, Stepping in and being your uh, uh, your champion, your your uh, uh, your your entree is really important. And uh, you know, cold calling is much too difficult and not very uh, not very productive. I know you're right, Dick. This has been great. I really appreciate it. I appreciate how forthright you are and how accessible you are, and I really appreciate it. I mean, mute, unmute everybody so we can all echo this together. Dick. All righty. So, um, 